Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. Some Europeans call them Frankenstein foods, and some critics in America just call them Franken foods. But whatever they're called, genetically modified crops, apparently safe and wholesome, at least so far, now cover one fourth of all American cropland. Joining Think Tank to discuss the benefits and possible risks of genetically modified foods are Margaret Mellon, director of the Agriculture and Biotechnology Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists and co-author of The Ecological Risks of Engineered Crops. Morris Levin, research professor at the University of Maryland's Biotechnology Institute and co-editor of the briefly titled volume Engineered Organisms in Environmental Settings, Biotechnological and Agricultural Applications and Mark Cohn of the International Food Policy Research Institute and editor of Hunger in a Global Economy. The topic before the House, Harvesting Biotech, this week on Think Tank. Genetic modification takes a gene from one species of animal or plant and inserts it into a different species, permanently changing its genetic code. In the past decade, this technology has been used to breed crops that can resist frosts, diseases, and herbicides. And some even come with their own built-in pesticides, no spraying required. In 1998, about 35% of America's corn crop and 45% of all soybeans were genetically modified. Furthermore, the biotechnology industry is promising consumers value-added foods as well by inserting additional vitamins, iron, and other nutrients into our produce. So far, so good. Scientists have found no dangers associated with genetically modified foods, but some environmentalists fear potential safety risks for consumers or the possibility of upsetting a delicately balanced ecosystem. In the past year, public outcry abroad has led the European Union to refuse some of America's genetically modified foodstuffs. It will be a major issue on the table as the World Trade Organization opens its next round of talks in Seattle. Do existing benefits outweigh potential harm? Is there potential harm? Is European skepticism warranted? To answer these and other questions, we turn now to our expert panel. Lady, gentlemen, thank you for joining us, Think Tank. Uh, Maury, can you give us sort of the uh, two-paragraph layman's um, short course on what we're talking about? I, I certainly can try. Okay. I, I think you said it correctly. Uh -oh. Biotechnology <laughs> takes a gene from one species and puts it into another species, permanently changing the second species' uh, genome, uh, its inheritable characteristics. And those characteristics, are, are uh, those genes that are transferred, are ones that people feel will benefit the consumer. The thing, of course, you have to think in... And, and the producer, I mean, of course. That's part of the complication. The, the consumer is the farmer. The, the companies are dealing with the, with the farmers. The farmers are dealing with, with the people who eat the food. So there's two different types of consumers. So the first level, if you will, is company to farmer. Right. And what's, what's happening is... Uh, improvements in, in, in uh, needs for fertilization, uh, ability to, to resist insects, things that will give the farmer a higher yield, more bang for the buck. That's really what's going on right now. And the second part of what, and you said it also, is um, additional nutritive characteristics and um, perhaps even better flavors. That's really far in the future. Uh, but th that, that will benefit the, the, the general consumer, the person who eats the foods. Margaret, did he say anything wrong? I just want to emphasize that it is 
a wholly artificial technology that takes genes from one organism and puts it into another. Because it is wholly artificial, these gene transfers are not bound or constrained by any uh, natural boundaries. So you can take a gene from any organism, from a cow, and move it into the genome of any other, a starfish, a corn plant, uh, an oak tree. So to that extent, it's a very powerful uh, technology, but it is a new one. It, it puts us in, in new territory scientifically. It is a technology that is wholly unlike the gene transfer technologies we've relied on for eons, i.e. traditional breeding, uh, selective breeding of organisms to improve them for agriculture. Well, the other point I'd like to... It to, does the same thing, though. It, well, it, it enhances uh, resistance to disease. That's been done commercial right. by, by commercial breeding. It enhances ability sure. to grow in different places. It, so it, really it does attempts the same in some things. instances to do the same thing, and others it does things that you can't do at all using traditional breeding. I also have some, uh, uh, some comments about the notion of there being benefits. Um, this is a technology that has been hyped from the day one. It was going to provide miraculous benefits both to farmers and consumers. Uh, 16 or 17 years into the technology, I think it's proven to be much more difficult to, to do genetic engineering, much more costly than people expected. And in general, uh, the, what people have been able to accomplish with the technology has really been uh, N you know, not very much. Well, but I mean, 16 or 17 years after the discovery of the commercial application of electricity, there wasn't a whole lot to see either. But 50 years later and 100 years later, the world was turned upside down, mostly beneficially, I think. I mean, is that just by saying, well, it's taken 16 or 17 years, does that prove much? It may not <coughs> prove much, but I think it does, uh, it, it's important to get the tone of this debate right. And it is at least in my experience, biotechnology, at least to date, always promises far more than it delivers. You you're, you're are correct in, in a sense. I mean, clearly there are more things to come from biotechnology than have been delivered. But part of the, 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 part of the reason that people are hyping it is because of, of industrial and commercial and, and financial concerns of the companies that are trying to raise money for their own benefits. Exactly. There's, there's no, I don't argue with that at all. But you, you really can't say that, that biotechnology hasn't produced things of benefit. It's, but if you look into the pharmaceutical world, thousands of, of I, medicinal products. Right, but that, yeah. we, we're, we're, we're talking about agriculture. Let's talk about agriculture. Okay. I mean, Even I, in agriculture, yeah. there is a lot of debate, but, but many people will agree, most people will agree that the amount of pesticide utilization where, where where there are where the pesticide resistance crops are being used is decreasing or has decreased yield in many cases has been shown to increase there are lots of graphs i could have brought with me showing you well <laughs> under the recently approved budget the us taxpayers are paying 8 billion dollars largely we be, because we produce uh, too much uh, commodity crops uh, for the, the world market. There's an excess of supply in the world market because people, because farmers cannot get the prices that they, um, that they need to cover their costs of production. As, as taxpayers, we're paying eight billion dollars uh, in subsidies. So we need to, to ask, I mean, and, and that is an illustration of a number of things. One is what is whether we really need new production technologies uh, in the United States at all. Uh, if we're, you know, paying, paying uh, through the nose uh, because, in fact, we're already overproducing. But the other is how complicated the agricultural uh, economy really is, and and that there really are not direct relationships between reduced co uh, costs for farmers and and consumer prices. But that's a whole let, different subject, and I think let, that's a red herring. Yes, we're paying a, a subsidy. Maybe the answer to the subsidy is to close off some farms and not grow. There's a whole other answer. Nothing to do with biotechnology. Well, I just The wanted, biotechnology but, says well, if, if, uh, if a farmer buys Monsanto seeds with Roundup built in and then uses Roundup, he will produce more of whatever that seed grows for less money. He will make more money. 
And that's, sometimes that's they do, and about. sometimes they don't, because that's Monsanto and, actually and try, ca charges a technology fee, which course. tries to capture whatever savings the farmer. Of course, but has. the farmer's not a dummy. He's not going to do it if it does not make but any money. That's, some farmers will do it just for increased flexibility in uh, in operations. Some gain. But but the numbers but, okay, are not I, there I, to uh, prove uh, uh, to prove increased Time profits out. at Time farm out. level. I, what are the potential dangers? There are health risks uh, associated with the consumption of the food, and there are environmental risks. Give, give us the one paragraph bite on each one. Okay, and that the uh, the the health worst the health risk that we worry the most about right now is the allergenicity risk. Um, As in allergy, Aller allergenicity. Allergenicity. That is moving new allergens uh, into the food supply uh, that haven't been there in the past, and most importantly moving allergens into foods that people don't know to avoid. The problem uh, is the following. If you're allergic to shellfish, you know to avoid shellfish. You know to avoid shrimp. If a genetic engineer takes uh, a, a gene for a protein from shrimp and moves it into a tomato, you don't know to avoid the tomato. And yet the science is quite clear that an allergen that causes a problem to you in shrimp will also cause a problem to you once it's moved into oh, tomato. Uh, okay. Uh, I, item two is the en environment generally? Yes, there are environmental risks. The Roundup Ready uh, mm -hmm. soybean is a good example that's uh, tolerant to a commonly used herbicide. If you uh, move that into a crop and that herbicide tolerant trait moves into a weedy relative of that crop, You've just created a weed that resists commonly used herbicides. In Canada, they are creating canola resistant to, to the three most popular broad spectrum herbicides. Uh, that means they're creating, uh, I, if, if that's not a super weed, I mean, I'm not sure what, what would be. Mari, a lot of perhapses in there. A lot of perhapses in there. A lot of perhapses. A lot of perhapses. Lot of perhapses. And, 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 and I think how, do you, how do you deal with well, we can start at the just beginning. A, start, again, because I want to get into this policy matter, well, but, but just give in, us the science. Start in the beginning with allergy. The allergy issue is, is very real, of course. You yes. could create new, new tomatoes that, to which people are allergic. Yes. The FDA has, has a program that will keep those tomatoes either off the market or labeled. That's very straightforward. Now, in, in terms of ecological questions, superweeds have been created from commercial breeding. We have many superweeds now. You mean pre-biotech? Pre-biotech that weeds have been created. This is not anything new and, and different or unique to biotech. This has been going on since time immemorial. Single weeds that are resistant, resistant to the three are, broad spectrum herbicides, I don't think there single are Single weeds for that, that are resistant to different herbicides. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Johnson's grass in, in, in the West, for instance, now is a problem in, in farmland because it has acquired genes from corn that we're near it. Sorghum. Sorghum, sorghum not right. from sorghum. corn. All right, hold on for one minute. Let me just show you an insert. Earlier this year, we talked to Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman, and this is what he had to say about exporting genetically modified foods to Europe. I, I grant they have a different culture over there, and they, they call these Frankenstein foods. Then they think, I don't know what they think they'll do to you, but the fact of the matter is, is that as long as we make sure that good, objective, sound science prevails in these judgments, then we've got to let the chips fall where they may. Mark, uh, your turn. Uh, give us the uh, quick breakdown on what the trade and commercial aspects of this scientific situation have led to. Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of factors. Uh, first of all, the World Trade Organization Agreement uh, has provisions relating to what they call sanitary and phytosanitary standards. That is to say, phytosanitary, uh, phytosanitary plant health. How do you spell phyto? Uh, P-H-Y-T-O. Okay. Not, not like the dog. No, right. Uh, okay. But the, the point is, uh, you can impose these standards uh, uh, under the rules of the World Trade Organization on the basis of what they call sound science and they have to be applied across the board. You can't say, well, uh, we don't think stuff from the United States is healthy or we don't think stuff from developing countries is healthy. It has to be based on a set of standards that are uniform. Uh, so there's a disagreement between the United States and Europe uh, 
as to whether this is being applied in the case of genetically modified foods. That's, that's one area. Another important area in world trade is the provision on intellectual property rights. All members of the World Trade Organization are supposed to have intellectual property rights laws in place according to a timetable that's been established. And this says that particular uh, processes as well as products can be subjected to patents and that includes plants, uh, uh, processes for arriving at uh, uh, plant materials. And so uh, it means that if developing countries want access, and this doesn't just apply to biotech again, it applies to all uh, uh, science and technology relating to food potentially, uh, they may have to pay licensing fees or they may not have access. I, I, I know you're particularly concerned with the developing world. I mean, I, I gather the European situation is sort of, uh, well, Frankenstein Foods sums it all up. I mean, there's some kind of a Dutch tulip disease going around that people are going into some kind of a mania, near, near as I can determine. Hold on, hold on, Margaret. Uh, but sketch in for us your concerns about as this thing plays out, um, what it is going to do to the developing world, the poor people. Well, from our point of view, the big problem... And our point, meaning your institute? IFPRI, yes, so International Food Policy Research right. Institute. We're mostly concerned about uh, developing countries. And I think there are some other aspects of biotechnology that differ from conventional crop breeding that, that are important for developing countries. Uh, most of the so-called Green Revolution uh, breakthroughs in agriculture were developed uh, in the public sector by international agricultural research centers, national institutions in both the developed and the developing countries. So there was a public sector government role. And, and, the and, research and, in biotech and, has been and, very and, much a... And the Rockefeller Absolutely. Institute, Rockefeller Institute. Absolutely. Work, the foundation in, world Working in the, in, in the Philippines with, with the miracle precisely, rights. Yeah, right. Precisely. The difference here is this is private sector research and in many cases it's proprietary research, uh, which means then the companies that have done the research want to recoup the costs. Uh, therefore, they focus on precisely the United States, uh, other developed countries, and large-scale farms in better-off developing countries like Argentina, as opposed to developing, uh, let's say, drought-tolerant crops for West Africa. Our trade policies do more to disadvantage you know, farm, uh, uh, farmers in, in very poor countries than anything we could offer them in terms of trickle-down technology. You know, we flood the world with cheap commodity crops that we subsidize, as I said, to the tune of billions of dollars. That does not help the world's poor farmers. In it, fact, it, what it, it does is... It helps the world's de poor eaters. It may do, help mean, some know, of the world's poor eaters. Not, not necessarily, because yeah. the poor eaters may be farmers, so if they lose their livelihood, then they're not eating. I mean, even if the food's cheap, if they have no income, income. they can't get it. And, and so I think it's important to focus on developing agriculture in the developing world. The poor no, people no are primarily living in rural areas. They're going to earn their income from agriculture. Uh, and this is where well, we it, see it, that there might again, be... Except, again, the whole flow of modernism is uh, farm to city. I mean, that, that's, that's happening uh, because that's, of all the things that's we're true, talking about. That's true, and that's population. happening. Yeah. Right. But, but it's going to continue. The poverty is staying rural. In Latin America, which yeah, is 70 percent people, rural, poverty people, is still... But when you move people out of rural into urban, you diminish the poverty rate. Well. Or the, or the poverty moves to the cities. I mean, that happens, too. Now, I, I want to ask Maury a question. In an earlier incarnation, you were with the Environmental Protection Agency. I worked for them for 30 years. For 30 years. So you are not some gung-ho, free market, Adam Smith. Definitely not. I was a worry ward, worry ward for the environment. That, that's, that's my chair today. <laughs> now, how, how do you view this uh, environmental and market system blend as we're talking about it. And I'm looking to you for some yeah. credibility in terms of a person who has a background in, in sort of many aspects of this field and are you're the last thing from a corporate spokesman. 
I think there is a there's definitely a, a regulatory system in place. And by the way, I'm also on a, a panel now looking at the regulatory system, National Academy panel. Uh, there is a regulatory system in place in the U.S. Use, there are three agencies involved, and we, we all know them, agriculture, yeah, EPA, and, and food and drug. And they, they, they look at the ecological and the f health, human health problems related to food and crops and agriculture and all sorts of things. And the systems that they use were developed over the years with commercial breeding in mind. And, and the decision by eminent scientists, and I happen to agree, is that there's no difference in kind between commercial breeding and biotechnology. I, I, I cannot agree with you that it's completely different, because it, it really isn't. You produce the same product, you I mean, produce You're cross saying that crossbreeding and, and uh, I mean, Mendel did it and lots of other people did it o o over the years, creating hybrids and all that. The same, same deal, except better quicker. Better, we're, we're better equipped. And furthermore, when, when, and this gets into the, the issue of labeling, which, which, is, which is also very major. Are you in favor of labeling? I'm in favor of labeling if you can figure out what it is you're trying to label. Are you in favor of labeling? Are you in favor of labeling? Even I'm in favor of labeling. Yeah, but, okay. but how yes. do you figure out what you're trying to label? That's I'm, the question. I'm not going to tell you. You see, you, you talk about natural. The, the, in Europe, they produce beer with yeast, which we do too. The yeast that they use in Europe has been irradiated by gamma irradiation. High peculiar varieties of those yeasts are used because they've been irradiated to produce the beer. Is that natural? Should that be labeled engineered? Is that any different from taking a gene from a yeast and moving it into another yeast, or taking a gene from someplace and moving it in? It's not any different. No, irradiation is also a process that consumers care about, and where food has been irradiated, that food ought to be labeled. That is a direct analogy you. to where okay, but, food but, has but, been produced but, but, by genetic engineers. But are you against engineer? irradiation? Let's just say we label it. Are you against irradiation? It's not natural. It's, I, it's exactly what you said. I actually, my organization has no position on it. Although well, no, I'm we asking you, not your be. organization. Are you against irradiation, which, as I understand it, prevents things like salmonella and, and, and other bacteria from being transmitted through the food chain? Um, I don't think that's the reason it's being introduced, um, but I'm certainly not uh, uh, across the board against it. Okay. You had one thing yes, to say, uh, and, and, I and then we got to the a health and safety issues because we do have a regulatory system in this country. Uh, they're in their infancy or non-existent in many developing countries. And if uh, the, the potential of biotechnology uh, is going to be explored in those countries, there have to be uh, the development of the same kinds yep. of health and safety before the introduction. Yes. It, 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 by, by those countries. Yes, yes. with help from uh, the developed countries and aid agencies, uh, yeah. technical and financial assistance. Yeah. And UNEP, UNEP funds us, U amongst UNEP, others. United Nations. UNEP is the United Nations. They fund us to go to different countries and teach risk assessment, how you do it, give they, them the benefit of our experience. But they remain sovereign decisions of the nations of, themselves. Right. Okay. Let me just ask this question. Brief answer, please. Uh, it's almost the year 2000. Let's fast forward to the year 2010, 10 years from now. Briefly, where are we going to be in this process? Well, I think, I think Margaret's questions are going to be answered. There, there are definite benefits to biotechnology, and I, I do believe, really, that our agriculture will, be, will, be, will benefit, the farmer will be making more money, and ultimately the, 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 the second-level consumer will have a better product and it will be cheaper. I would hope that we would have greater attention to poverty in the world and to look at how biotechnology and conventional technologies might be used to reduce poverty. You think that's going to happen? Uh, well, uh, I hope uh, there's enough enlightened leadership in the world that it does. I think the technology will, uh, its rate of acceptance will be much slower than it is right now. I think that the developing world will, uh, will step back and really look at whether it presents consumer benefits and whether people want to take uh, risk for those benefits. In large uh, uh, part, I think, uh, 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 people will pass up the technology, uh, perhaps at least uh, as one that needs to pervade our entire food system and about which people don't have much choice. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Margaret Mellon, Morris Levin, and Mark Cohn, and thank you. We encourage feedback from our viewers 
via email. It's very important to us. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. We at Think Tank depend on your views to make our show better. Please send your questions and comments to New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. Or email us at thinktank at pbs.org. To learn more about Think Tank, visit PBS online at www.pbs.org. And please let us know where you watch Think Tank. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media which are solely responsible for its content.